Please, sir, I really drove this far for no reason. You drove this far for no reason? Yes, sir. I... When marathoning episodes of To Catch a Predator, it's easy to pick up on the formula they established after the third episode, the Riverside Sting. It was actually in this sting which they started partnering up with law enforcement to ensure that the men who left the house would actually face some sort of punishment for their crimes. The first two stings in the series actually operated a little differently. You see, once Chris had finished his interview, the men were free to walk out that door. Same as always. Only, they were actually free to leave. There were no cops or Call of Duty cosplayers out there ready to force them to the ground and take them into custody. Everything changed after the second sting. From here on in, Chris and the team felt they had a responsibility to the public to make sure that every perv answered for their sins once they left the house. But why? What was it that forced them to change their setup? Well, that what was actually a who. And that who is John Kennelly. John Kennelly has the dishonor of being one of the most notorious predators ever caught by the show. His socially inept attitude and complete indifference to the things he was doing was both hilarious and kind of alarming. The story starts in an online chat in which John was talking to someone who he thought was a 14 year old boy. And from there, it didn't take long for things to turn sexual. John tried to gain the confidence of the boy, claiming that he was a teacher at a prestigious high school. From there, John's degeneracy comes into play when he starts to tell the boy just how attractive he perceives him to be and how badly he wants to be boyfriends with the decoy. Eventually, a date was set and John was invited to the house. Before he actually entered, the PJ members wanted to see just how far they could push John. They asked him to enter the house naked just to see if he would actually do it. No one expected him to strip down and walk into the house completely naked, but John proved them wrong when he did exactly that. John entered the house with a 12 pack of beer under his arm looking for the boy he'd been talking to. He was told to sit his naked ass down on the stool, close his eyes, and count down to one, with a surprise coming his way when he finished. The surprise came in the form of Chris Hansen, who was also surprised by what he was seeing. One of the best parts of the episode was seeing Chris take a moment to take in what's happening. It's like he's questioning every decision in his life that's led him to this very moment. Chris eventually approaches, handing John a towel to cover himself so he could be properly interviewed and to save the editors the issue of having to blur out his magnum dong. Magnum dong! From here, John is immediately apologetic. He believes Chris to be the boy's father and tries to blame his actions on the boy. When Chris asks to know what his profession is, John can't seem to decide which lie he wants to go with. Is he a bus driver or is he a teacher? He decides to go with being a teacher. I'm not a psychologist, but it's pretty clear to me that there is something going on with John. I'm pretty sure that him being attracted to kids is probably like the 47th thing that's actually wrong with him. What are the other 46? <laughs> well, if I know. For me, John Kennelly is a man more defined by his actions than anything else. His interview is pretty unremarkable as he just keeps taking pot shots from Chris while either lying or making pale attempts to take responsibility for his own actions. Chris ends the interview and John is free to leave. During his little outro, Chris claimed that if John had just left and changed his ways, that he would have been a memorable character. And he did become a memorable character, just not for the reasons Chris wanted him to be. If he had just left it at that, you know, Kennelly would have been a memorable character, but what he did the next day just put him over the top. Because there was no law enforcement outside ready to apprehend him, John was free to leave. And less than 24 hours later, John was back online, chatting up another young decoy. He called himself Shane and asked the decoy to meet up with him at a local Golden Arches establishment. At this point, Chris was completely livid. He couldn't even begin to understand what kind of man would be so brave as to even try committing the same felony within a 24 hour time period. Chris and the crew track him down and hilarity ensues. I have been in television for 24 years. I just came to get something to eat. And I have very seldom been at a loss for words. Sir, I just came but to get something to eat. But I don't even know what to ask you first. I just came to get something to eat. John, we've been through this before. What are you doing? I've got the chat log again. 
What happens if you really did meet a 13 year old boy? What happens? I don't know. I don't know? It's illegal to have a talk on the internet with a minor with intent to have sex with that minor. You've done it twice in two days that we know of. That's a federal offense. You can go to prison for it. Do you know that? Yes. Then why do you do it? John walks away. Shoelace is untied and no day in sight. It's important to note that while Chris and the crew weren't working with law enforcement, that didn't mean that they were just letting these guys walk away scot-free. They would hand over the chats and any accompanying evidence to the proper authorities. But ultimately, it was up to the DA to decide whether or not they would pursue any charges against these men. And even though NBC and Chris Hansen were attached to the sting, there were no guarantees here. John was free to go home, but not for long. He was arrested and his computer was seized. So now, I want you to take a guess at just how many years this monster was sentenced to. Ready? Drum roll, please. The answer is... Yes, for some reason that I'll never understand, John Kennelly received no prison time for his attempts at molesting not one, but two different underage boys. But it's also important to note that he didn't exactly walk away clean either. While he didn't have to serve any prison time, he did receive a two-year suspended sentence, was placed on probation, and had to register on the RSO list. At this point, you'd expect John to go quietly and live out the rest of his life without even so much as jaywalking. Right? Well, guess what? That would have been asking a little too much. Less than a year after his conviction, John made his way to a local park where he spotted two 15-year-old girls walking by. He called out to them, getting their attention, only to pull a cornholio and expose himself to the girls before running away like an idiot. I feel like I can't even make a joke at this point. But believe me, I can, but there is literally nothing funny about this situation. It didn't take long for the cops to ID him and John was quickly picked up by the local PD. From a little information there is, it would appear that John was in charge for the situation and was most likely given another slap on the wrist. If you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Okay, time's up. What fascinates me about John is how he was able to escape having to face any consequences for the crimes he committed. I'm not sure why he was continually given one second chance after another, but it's clear to me that neither the judge nor the prosecutor presiding over his cases gave a single shit about the danger he posed to his community. While well, I don't think that prison would have cured John or put him on the right path, it would have spared any more potential victims from being targeted by this unhinged moron. Beyond that encounter at the park, John seems to have cooled down and seems to be doing his best to keep a low profile. He's been spotted here and there, and the occasional picture does surface now and then. It's been said that he's a proud member of the Rocky Horror Picture Show community, and that its members are more than willing to protect him from harassment or anyone trying to publicly out him. While John will probably be forever remembered as the man who walked in naked to meet a teen, I'll always remember him as the man who changed TCAP forever. He walked away, and in doing so, the show made sure that no other predator would ever be able to do the same.